everyone. Happy Sabbath. Scripture today is 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 6, and it is on page 1167. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the word that then existed perished being flooded with water. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How are you guys doing? Let's see if this will actually connect. Let's see. Oh, I love Sabbath miracles. They worked the first time. So I've uh, been thinking about this for quite some time, ever since I was in high school, and uh, learned quite a lot over the years. And so this is just what impressed me as far as the nature of the flood, because I don't subscribe to a lot of fringe ideas, but one big one I subscribe to is that the Bible is actually means what it says and it's actually real. Uh, and so that's a fringe idea in, in this day and age. And, but uh, to me, there's a lot of really good evidence to believe it, really good even scientific evidence to believe it. So that's what I'd like to share with you today. But before I get uh, all off in that, I'll have to say that last week I got caught off guard and I made a, a mistake. Bill Howell was asking me how many chromosomes there were, and I said 24 or 48, right? Turns out there's 48 chromosomes in apes, <laughs> but not in humans. I mean, 23 in me. I mean, who hasn't heard about that, right? So, but to save myself a little bit, two of the human chromosomes were fused uh, during some sort of population bottleneck, like at the flood. Because Adam and Eve probably had 48 uh, and 24 pairs, just like apes did. The chromosome number two is fused. It's two chromosomes in one. And uh, there's two centromeres. There's... It's like a doubled chromosome where they get fused. And this happens to a lot of other animals and everything, like different kinds of foxes have different numbers of chromosomes. Different types of horses have different numbers of chromosomes because of this fusion problem during population bottlenecks. Same thing happened to humans. So humans really do have 48. So I was right, Bill. <laughs> it's just the two of them are fused. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so you can call me an ape if you want. <laughs> So what about the flood? So this is Professor James Barr, distinguished professor of Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible at Oxford, Princeton, Vanderbilt, very well known. He's a late professor. He's passed away now. He's also um, a secular professor. He doesn't actually believe what the Bible says, but he believes that the authors of the Bible intended to say something very specific about the flood. And uh, so I'd just like to start this out with this quote. It says, probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that A, creation took place in a series of six days, which are the same as the days of 24 hours in our experience. B, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition of chronological from the beginning of the world up to the later stages of biblical history. And C, Noah's flood was understood to be a worldwide flood and extinguish all human and animal life except for those on the ark. Or to put it negatively, the apologetic arguments which suppose that the days of creation are long eras of time, the figures of years not to be chronological, and the flood to be, be merely a local Mesopotamian flood are not taken seriously by any such professors as far as I know. So there's a lot of Christians who believe these things, that the, world, that the flood was a local Mesopotamian flood. There was six days of creation. It was six vast eras of time, millions and millions of years. And you'll hear this a lot even within Christian churches. 
But that's not what the writers of Genesis intended to convey. That's clear even among secular Hebrew scholars of the Bible. So who was right? Did they actually, what they intended to convey, is it real or not? Is it true or not? Or did they just completely get it wrong? Because that's not what they said in the Genesis account. It was a worldwide flood. So is there evidence for that or not? And if there's not, for me anyway, the Bible loses credibility. It's not trustworthy in what it says about the future or about Jesus or anything else if the biblical flood isn't true. So according to the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, before the biblical flood, there were no great oceans. There were no great mountain ranges or deserts. There were like rolling hills. It was a very beautiful place, but there were no like ragged, jagged mountain ranges like there are, like the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas, nothing like that. And there was no giant oceans like the Atlantic or the Pacific. There were four great rivers that watered the earth, and the earth was watered by pumping these rivers around underground. And then on the surface there was these four great rivers and springs of water, and every morning it would dew and water the ground that way. So the, the motion of the moon around the earth would pump the water by expanding the earth as the moon moved around the earth. It would contract and expand and pump. It was like a giant underground pumping system that watered the world. It was very different than the world today. There was no rain. It never rained. There were no clouds in the sky. And uh, so the people who lived before the flood never even thought of this concept of water falling down from the sky because the world was watered from underneath, not from above. So it's a very different world. And I kind of, there's no pictures of this, so I kind of drew one. <laughs> I kind of imagined it. There's four great rivers going around the world, and then most of the water was underneath the, the crust of the earth, and it was pumped around the world like it was recycled that way, a big giant pumping system that watered the world. So, and then all of this, when the flood happened after the Noah and his family were in the ark for seven days, Nothing happened, and then all of a sudden, the Bible says, in one day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up in a single day. How in the world does that happen? All the fountains of the great deep around the whole world were broken up in one day. I was like, the Bible doesn't say exactly how that happens, but I think it was probably many impacts, the large impacts from asteroids that hit the earth, like all of a sudden this, you know, falling stars, actually, we went through an asteroid belt and just got hammered by asteroids all in one day, and it broke up the surface of the earth like an egg. Because the crust of the earth is fairly thin, if you get hit by giant asteroids all over the place at one time, like the Yucatan Peninsula, half or about a third of the Gulf of Mexico is an impact crater, and that impact crater is uh, uh, quite wide, uh, like a hundred and some miles wide, and or the actual asteroid was over a hundred miles wide. And it made a giant crater that filled about a third of the Gulf of Mexico. And the water, the, the, it depends on if you think that it's just the, the way the Gulf of Mexico was now or at that point was there water covering the whole world because it says in the Bible that it covered the mountains of that day by like 20-some feet. So if the whole world was covered by water already at that point because all the fountains of the Great Deep had already burst and come up and were starting to fill the the earth with water and cover up everything. It wasn't the rain necessarily that, that flooded the earth. It was the fountains of the great deep shooting up from giant geysers and cracks and fissures in the earth that started filling up the earth with water. And then these asteroids kept hitting the earth, bam, 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 and creating giant tsunamis that would, uh, when they hit, they would go up several hundred feet. In fact, about fit the, this one particular sent out a tsunami that it was initially 15,000 feet tall. Giant tsunami, half the size of Mount Everest uh, right now. And, and it would go around in a circle around the whole world because there was nothing to stop it. There were no mountain ranges back then. And it, it was all water all around the world. So it would go all the way around the world. And after it went through an area, it would dry up for a period of time because it would take all the water with it. And so animals could run around and make footprints and stuff and raindrops that we have in the fossil record. But it'd go all the way around the world to hit on the other side and then bounce off itself and come back. Boom, boom. And many impacts were happening all over the place. And so these tsunamis were coming from all kinds of different directions, depending on where the impact hit. And here's just an illustration of the one that hit the um, Gulf of Mexico. 
15,000 feet high tsunami, about 2.8 miles high initially. Here's a list of all known or suspected impact craters in the world and their relative sizes and where in the fossil record that they are located. So they kept hitting all throughout the flood, bam, 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 within the fossil record. Here's another listing of the, of the map. There's over 800 impacts that we know of uh, in this picture anyway. And that's just the ones on land because there were no great oceans at the time. So whatever was hitting where the, there is no current land, it's not, it, it was erased. So we don't have record of that. So there was thousands of these things that were hitting all the time during the flood, causing giant tsunamis all over the place. And the, the earth was cracked and the, the fountains of the great deep burst forth. So it wasn't just like a bathtub slowly filling with water. When these things burst forth, they sent up giant, huge sheets of water in, up into the uh, outer space. They got shot up under extreme pressure and then flooded the continents, uh, like this picture illustrates, like that. All around the world, it just got... And the continents started forming at that point because there were no continents before the flood. Everything was a solid uh, crust, and uh, there were no great oceans. There were no continents like Africa, South America. Nothing like that existed. So everything was shattered by the, uh, at the flood, and the continental drifts started to happen, and, the, and they started moving apart from each other and going underneath each other and creating the ocean basins. So the, trench, the ocean basins are brand new. There's no sedimentary layers like the fossil record on the ocean bases because they got... Uh, when they, the continent split apart, magma started forming underneath and started creating a thin, very, the ocean basins are thin. So a thin crust in the bottom of the oceans and the continents as they moved apart allowed for the water to spill off the continents and go into the ocean basins. And that's why we don't have the world being covered with water right now. Also, initially the drift was very fast. As soon as the continents started to split apart, they traveled very fast like cars when they crash, they're initially traveling very fast. And then when they hit each other and start buckling, like forming mountain ranges, ocean trenches, they slow down. So the current rate of continental drift is about a centimeter or so uh, per thousand years. But back then, it was very fast. And it's only because after the Himalayas got built and the Rocky Mountains got built and the ocean trenches got built that the continental drift slowed down to its current rate. But initially, it was very fast. It wasn't 200 million years ago. And we'll get into that in a bit. So initially, it looked, they were all attached. They got cracked up, and then they started moving until we have the current situation that we have today. So also, this is kind of illustration of when they, all the fountains of the Great Deep got broken. It just shot up just giant walls of water from these cracks in the crust. So is there enough water? Uh, currently, there, because Genesis says that all the mountains were covered by 20 feet of water, the highest mountains of that day, which, are, again, there were no Rocky Mountains or Appalachians or anything like that, or Mount Everest back then, so they were kind of rolling hills. But the highest thing that they had back then was covered by 20 feet of water when the, at the height of the flood. So is there enough water for that? In the oceans currently today, if everything was kind of relatively flattened out, there would be enough water for that. But it's, it's even worse than that. Back in 2014, it was discovered that about 400 miles down below the Earth cr Earth's crush, crust, there's a lot more water. There's about three times the volume of the current ocean water in this uh, area be below the Earth's crust, about 400 feet down. And it's stored in this um, material called blue ringwood ringwoodite that's like a spongy rock that stores all this water. And so what would happen if you kind of suddenly squeeze the sponge? What would happen to all that water? It would just burst forth out and cause three times or four times the volume of the, of the current water that we have on the planet, on the surface of the planet. And so um, here, Jacobson, co-author of the study that talked about this, he said, we should be grateful for this deep reservoir uh, because if it wasn't there, it would be on the surface of the earth and mountaintops would be the only land poking out, like the highest mountaintops. Because if you just put three times more volume on the surface of the earth, 
It's going to cover everything. And so what happened, I think, is this sponge got squeezed. All this water came out, or at least most of it. And then it kind of got reabsorbed as the, everything split apart. And so that's where most of the water went back down underneath the crust. There's also evidence that the uh, tsunamis went all the way around the world because every layer that you look on, and I've seen it with my own eyes, every layer that you look on, the surface of every layer in the fossil record has ripple marks on the top of it. I was like, these were all deposited by water. You could tell which way the water was going. You can say it was going that way or that way, which way the water was going. Every single layer, and even the ones with dinosaur footprints on them, the dinosaur footprints are made on the top of these layers with these ripple currents on the same layer. So the footprint's there with the ripple currents, and you can tell which way the water was flowing as the dinosaur was walking on it. So uh, this was all done by Arthur Chadwick. He's, he's analyzed these ripple currents based on 330,000 measurements across the world, but primarily in North America. And uh, they're called paleocurrents, and so here's his map of different layers. Based on the layers, they went different directions. So as you go lower in the fossil record and you go higher and higher and higher, the, the ripple marks change direction. But for any given layer, they're pretty much all going in the same direction all the way around the whole world. All the way across entire continents and even between continents, they're going in the same direction. So you're like, this giant tsunami went swoosh all the way across from the northwest to the southwest of the United States and just made ripple marks all the way across for a given layer. And here they are, the continents, if you put them together, you can tell that they match other continents. The ripple marks are going in the same direction for a given layer. This, Arthur, Arthur Chadwick is out at Southwestern Adventist University, and he does a lot of these studies. And you can go with him on dinosaur digs in the summer if you want to sign up for that. He's a very interesting. He's got a lot of really good published work on this. So the Navajo, for example, the Navajo sandstone, which is in the Grand Canyon, it covers a huge area, a dozen states or so. But the sand in the Navajo sandstone didn't come from that area where the Grand Canyon is. It came from the Appalachians. So, and you can see that it formed these, these uh, layers of sandstone, like you can see uh, at the beach for underwater sand movement. And you can see which way the sand was going. But we know that the sand didn't come from that location. The Navajo sandstone in particular came from the Appalachians across the entire continent. It was washed there in big sheets of sand under 300 feet of water based on the, the waves of sand that we can see that's in the Navajo. They were formed under 300 feet of water, and we know how fast the water was moving, about four meters per second, uh, in order to create those sand dunes in the Navajo. And we also know that the Coconino sandstone, it didn't came from the Grand Canyon area either. It came from the north. It was washed down from the north because it's a different l layer. It's a different level, so it was washed from a different direction. But it, didn't, it was still washed there, and it still has ripple marks on top of it. And what's interesting about these sandstones, especially the Coconino, is it has footprints on it from lizards and salamanders and insects and spiders and stuff. And like 98% of these, these footprints are going uphill. So that's like I was asking one of my evolution friends, why are they going uphill? They believe they're like in the desert sand dunes. In the desert, why are all the animals only going uphill? He's like, well, they went uphill and came to the desert dune, and then they slid down the other side where the sand would cover up their footprints, and then they walked around the dune and came back up to their burrow. It's like, really? Come on. Even spiders are smarter than that, right? So there's studies done on these ripple uh, marks and also, also these sand dunes to show how deep the water was and how fast it was going. There's also called current lineation on the top of these sandstones. On every layer, there's what's called current lineation. You can go to the beach, and you can see where the ocean comes in, and when it goes out, it leaves current lineation like this. This only happens underwater. It doesn't happen by wind. So it can't be a desert. It can only be formed underwater, where it makes these Y-shaped patterns on the beach. You can go see it. I took this picture at the beach. But you can go, it's the same exact picture on the Coconino sandstone and the Navajo sandstone, they were all produced, all the layers were produced underwater. So how do you get sand across the entire continent, like 1,800 miles, slowly, 
over millions of years without any riverbed channels. Uh, also, how do you make it so flat? The Navajo sandstone, the Cochineo sandstone, they're extremely flat, over hundreds and hundreds of square miles, thousands of square miles. And they're like flat as a parking lot. How does that happen without sheet flooding to do it all at once? You can't do that over long spans of time. Also, what's interesting about the fossil record is that the footprints evolved before the dinosaurs. So in the lower layers, you have the footprints all walking around, dinosaur footprints all over the place, no bodies, no body fossils. As you move up, the footprints go away and the bodies start piling up as you go up the level in the fossil record. And so it's really weird from an evolutionary standpoint that you have footprints with no fossils and then you have fossils up higher with no footprints. That only make, it makes great sense from a flood perspective because you have the animals running around. Here comes a giant tsunami wave, smashes everything. You just barely make it with your life. You run around on the mud for a while and another tsunami comes. Wham! And so you get tireder and tireder and tireder because this flood lasted for a year, right? So eventually you survive a few of these tsunamis as a dinosaur, a big T-Rex or whatever. But eventually you just get worn out because you're running all the time. You get hammered by tsunamis over and over again. And finally you just die, right? But by then there's a bunch of layers of mud built up and you die on the top layer. It doesn't make any sense in the fossil record for the footprints to have evolved before the body fossils. That doesn't make any sense. Much more sense from a catastrophic model. This paper is published by Leonard Bland from uh, Loma Linda University, and it's actually published uh, in 1982, but no one talks about it. Dinosaur eggs are very interesting. This is a dinosaur nest where the mother was laying these eggs in a circle like this, but as she was laying them, mud kept flowing in so that the first lay eggs are on lower levels of mud than the, sec than the last egg. So as she's laying them, she's turning around laying the eggs, and mud keeps flowing in as she's laying the eggs until they finally get buried, but they're buried on different levels within the same nest. So the mud kept flowing in as she was laying them, but she got so desperate to lay her eggs that she couldn't hold them any longer, so she just laid them in the flood. So what's also interesting about dinosaur eggs is that like chicken eggs, usually chicken eggs only have one layer of eggshell, and unless the chicken is stressed. If you, if you keep like playing rock music at the chicken and chasing it around all the time, all day and night, it won't lay its egg. It keep, it'll keep it inside of itself and put another layer of eggshell on it. So it'll be a double eggshell, right? You know, eggs, for, in the fossil record, all dinosaur eggs are doubled or tripled around the entire world, wherever you find them. So the dinosaurs around the entire world for millions and millions of years were constantly stressed, <laughs> right? No, it doesn't make any sense outside of a flood model. So, yeah, they're, they're also very rare baby trackways for around the nest. They don't happen. Um, there's no hatched eggs. They're all preserved without hatching. It's very rare to find a hatched egg. And they're also with a pointy end downward, which would make sense if you're laid in loose mud or watery mud. Where the, point, the eggs would not be uh, with a pointy end downward on real nest in a dry land, but only if they could sink into the mud. Also, fossil bone orientation. Uh, Arthur Chadwick also does this. He went and analyzed millions of bone fragments, and they're all oriented with respect to flow. So here's a dinosaur. They're all supposed to have died during a volcano or uh, blocking out the sun, and they're walking along, and they get exhausted, and they fall over dead. But they all decide, hey, Fred, which way are you falling? Well, I'm going to fall this way. Me too. So they all fall in the same direction, right? No, they're all washed in the place. All these dinosaur giant graveyards, the biggest ones on Earth, they all show current orientation with respect to flow. Also, it's very rare to have a head on a dinosaur. They're all headless dinosaurs. That doesn't make sense if you just fell over dead randomly. Uh, but it does make sense if you got washed into a place where your head is flopping along all the way and eventually breaks off and, and flows away somewhere else. But if you just fell over on the ground dead randomly, you should have a bunch more heads attached. But that's very rare to find a dinosaur body with its head attached. So it makes much more sense if it was a flood, a watery catastrophe that did this. There's a Morrison formation. They're all oriented with respect to flow. They've all been mapped out. 
Also, it was a very warm world right after the flood for like four or 500 years. The world was a very warm planet. It was very lush and very green and uh, millions of different kinds of animals, bison and, and uh, vast grasslands, including deer and, uh, and mammoths and everything, went up into the Arctic Circle and lived very happy. There were giant forests there. There were huge grasslands with a lot of these bisons died with buttercups in their mouths. So what happened is in one season, after a few hundred years of very blissful peace after the flood, in a single season, a sudden snap, cold snap happened, and there was an ice age and happened in one season. It froze these mammoths and all these other animals all together rapidly, like whammo. So some of them froze so fast they couldn't even swallow their food that they had in their mouths. In fact, uh, one of the biggest exports in Siberia is ivory because they keep fighting these mammoths and these, uh, these tusks all over the place. There's millions of them. And they all got frozen suddenly. But initially, it was a very warm world. Uh, there were no ice caps before or immediately after the flood. Uh, the ice age didn't happen for several hundred years later after that. So, um, and the mammoths last, even by mainstream thinking, Mammoths didn't die out until about 1700 BC by radiocarbon dating. They still lived on these islands after the flood until about 1700 BC. So at the same time, supposedly, Greenland was supposed to be covered with ice sheets in the same latitude for 400,000 years. That doesn't make any sense. Here you have mammoths living happily in Siberia, even North America, saber-toothed tigers, all, all within the Arctic Circle, uh, woolly rhinoceroses, but Greenland all by itself covered with ice sheet, right? No, there was no ice sheet in Greenland until all these things, until the sudden cold snap killed all the mammoths and everything else. So here we have the ex expanse of the ice sheet during the height of the ice age. New York City was under two miles of ice. There was basically ice all the way down almost to the well, a few miles above the green. In the middle of the world, there was this green belt. The Sahara Desert was green. Uh, also, during the height of the Ice Age, the Mediterranean was dry. There, there was no Mediterranean Sea. It was dry. And it was green. And the, the Sahara Desert was green and filled with lakes and all kinds of forests and animals were there as well. The Middle East, when Abraham showed up there, it was a land filling, filled with milk and honey. It was green with forests and grasslands and everything. It wasn't the desert it is today. That, uh, that changed after the ice receded and the Mediterranean filled up. Because when you have all the thick ice, it sucks all the water out, puts it in the ice sheet, and the oceans drop by several hundred feet, like 400 feet. So that, that's why the Mediterranean didn't have water in it. So it looked more like this. It was all green. And then the ice sheets covered most of, uh, you can see it com completely covered England, halfway down through the United States, it was all ice sheets. Um, so Africa, Middle East, uh, uh, Northern Europe, Central Europe, they were all very green during this time. This is Mediterranean. It was, uh, it was dry, it had some, well, the rivers drained into it because it was lower than the ocean, or uh, lower, there's no escape for where the water would go. So there was all these salt beds within the bottom of the Mediterranean right now where the rivers drained and then dried out. Here's uh, the Sahara Desert. It was covered with lakes and it was green and lush. And there were land bridges during that time. You could, you could walk from... Uh, Russia all the way through Alaska and down into North America. There was all land bridges because the water level was much lower and these things were all connected after the flood for a long time, hundreds of years. Also, what's interesting, we talked about it already briefly, is that the layers in the fossil record are very flat for thousands of square miles, flat as a parking lot, without evidence of rivers or erosion or mountain building or anything. The world was... If you believe in the flat world, that was it <laughs> before the flood. The world was a very flat place for millions and millions of years. And that, again, doesn't make any sense without a global water catastrophe. Why would that happen? There's, that's like a razor blade between the, la the layers if you go to the Grand Canyon. There's no erosion. There's no bioturbation. Bioturbation was when animals dig in the sediment and stir things up. 
And there's very little of that, what you would expect. And again, Arthur Chadwick published papers on this, saying the bioturbation bio for millions and millions of years just wasn't there as expected like it is today. Nothing got churned up. You'd only expect that to happen if you form the layers rapidly before animals can get deep enough to churn up the layers. You, feel, you form several hundred feet of layers and the digging animals can't get down that low to churn everything up. And so that's why they're preserved in such a flat, undisturbed state. Again, he published this. Uh, you can go look him up. He's, he's done some really good work on the science of flood geology, Arthur Chadwick. There's also a lack of ocean sediment. The oceans are supposed to be about 3 billion years old, but there's only enough sediment in the oceans uh, for about 8 million years worth. And I say 8 million years not because I believe that they're 8 million years old, but I, that I believe that right after the flood, all the water running off the continents took the sediment into the ocean that's currently there very rapidly. But it's not even close to the mainstream thinking where the ocean should be completely filled by sediment now many times over uh, at the current erosion rates, their current sedimentation rates. There's only about 8 million years worth. If there was really the current rate of, of erosion like there should be for all that time, in just 1 billion years, there'll be 20 miles of sediment in the ocean basins. There's not even close. Same thing with lack of erosion of actual mountains like uh, Mount Everest. Um, it would take just 10 million years to erode everything above sea level into the ocean, completely wipe out everything. So to say that Mount Everest got uplifted 20 million years ago doesn't make sense because it shouldn't be there. On top of Mount Everest, there's sedimentary layers, there's seashells and things like that. So it used to be flat, then it got pushed up, and it got pushed up to about twice its current height, but then half of it slid off about 20 million years ago in mainstream thinking. So it's only 29,000 feet tall. Now, it was about 15,000 meters tall. It's only 8,800 meters tall now. So, uh, but even with that, uh, current erosion rates about 200 centimeters per thousand years would make greater than 40,000 meters of erosion in the 20 million years. And there's, only, there's less than 3,000 meters of sedimentary layers currently on top of Mount Everest. And we know that that was there the whole time because we know half of it slid off. There's plenty of time to have completely wiped out those sedimentary layers many times over. So why are they still there if mainstream thinking is correct? And I'm not the only, I mean, this has been published. It's just that teachers and, and popular scientists like Richard Dawkins, they don't talk about this. Back in 1976, American Journal of Science C.R. Twindell, uh, um, South Australia, he talked about it, about being 200 million years old, and Mount Everest on all these things. He said, even if it is accepted that estimates of contemporary rates of degradation in land surfaces are several orders too high, an order of magnitude is 10 times. So several orders is hundreds, thousands of times too high. To provide an accurate yardstick of erosion in the geologic past, there's surely been ample time for the very ancient features preserved in the present landscape to have been eradicated several times over. The survival of these paleoforms, or mountains or continents themselves, is in some degree an embarrassment to all of commonly accepted models of landscape development. It's because we reject the floods, so basically everything that we're saying is nuts. So it only makes sense really if you accept a flood. Everything else is an embarrassment scientifically, right? Also, there's these giant coal beds that are very pure, hundreds of feet thick, requiring thousands of feet of sediment, of, of vegetation to form the pure coal beds. And there's no sulfur contamination, there's no uh, other types of contaminants like animals or shells or anything like that, it's pure coal. How do you do that over millions of years? You have to, the only thing can be explained with the flood, it can't be explained with a giant peat bog or anything like that, because that would be contaminated over millions of years. You can only have pure coal if you take a giant forest, uproot it with a giant tsunami, smash it against some hillside, several thousand feet deep of vegetation, and then cover it with mud that are several thousand feet thick, and smush it and get it very hot at that point. That's, it has to be catastrophically done. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. You can't do this with coal beds that are this thick unless there was a giant Noachian catastrophe. So it's 10,000 square miles, 200 feet thick, requiring six feet of vegetation for every one foot of coal. 
So six times two, 1,200 feet of vegetation, right? That can't happen slowly, Powder River Basin. Also, all the species are the same age genetically. All, all of us have mitochondrial DNA, and all of our mitochondrial have, and every different animal that's alive today has the same number of mitochondrial mutations based on uh, uh, reproductive rate and longevity. So if you calculate it all out, everything showed up at the same time. Of course, this was shocking from an evolutionary perspective because it's supposed to be evolution of species. Some are older than others and some are younger than others, according to Darwin, but not according to genetics. They're all the same age. But of course, they said they all emerged about 100,000 years ago. Humans emerged, ants emerged, sloths emerged, elephants birds, all, all exactly the same time, about 100,000 years ago. So how do I get around this 100,000 years? Because the mutation rate can be used as a clock. So to determine the age of an organism, how many mutations do you have? Well, uh, also these uh, species are, are isolated in sequence space. They're not like close to each other. They're distinctly isolated islands in sequence space. We can get into that in greater detail, that's a whole other topic. But this other paper published by Jensen, he said, well, let's look at the mutation rates. The mutation rates that said that everything's 100,000 years old, it's based on an assumed evolutionary relationship between humans and apes, like me being the ape man there. <laughs> but if you look at actual human pedigrees, where you can historically know this person lived in 1623, and, and take their original genetics, which we have since we have their bones, you can know what their mitochondrial DNA was and compare it with their known offspring to living today. And then you can calculate a mutation rate based on a known human pedigree. Well, it turns out the mutation rate's a lot faster, 20 times faster compared to the assumed evolutionary relationships between humans and apes. So it turns out instead of 100,000 years, all, everything alive today emerged in the last 300 years or around, around 600,000, so it's like 600, I keep using these big numbers, 6,000 years before now. So it started looking a lot more biblical, <laughs> so that everything emerged at the same time about 6,000 years ago. Does that sound familiar? So dinosaur preservation. Mary Schweitzer, about 10 years ago, started analyzing dinosaur bones, and she found soft tissue for the first time. <clears throat> Why? Not because soft tissue isn't common, it's as every large dinosaur bone analyzed since she did this. But she was the first one to accidentally find it because she left it in a petri dish with some acid by accident overnight. And when she came back, all the bone had dissolved and what was left was soft tissue, including blood vessels, cells, osteo osteocytes, red blood cells, and they were still stretchable and elastic, and they looked like fresh tissue. And she was absolutely shocked. In fact, fragments of DNA and protein have also been found, and they're sequenceable, like the DNA uh, is sequenceable, the small fragments, but they're sequenceable, and the protein itself is sequenceable as well. And you shouldn't have that, even by mainstream thinking, beyond 100,000 years. Even if you, even if uh, at ambient temperatures, even if you put it in a freezer, you shouldn't have it beyond a million years. And these dinosaur bones are not frozen. They're found like in Utah or whatever, and they still have soft tissue in them that's sequenceable. They also have radiocarbon in them that dates them at the same ages as the mammoths. They have the same amount of carbon-14 in them. And, of course, Mary Schweitzer won't date them with carbon-14, so creationists had to do it in their own lab because they refused, they asked, offered them to pay the cost plus an honorarium for them to do the own the radiocarbon dating, and they refuse to do it because they say it won't benefit us. So they refuse to do it. So the ones that were done, that were actually done, every single one, showed that the radiocarbon ages are the same as mammoths um, that lived right after the flood in a range from 16,000 years to 14,000 years before present. That's also an increased range because a lot of the carbon-12 that existed in the biosphere before the flood was buried by the flood. A lot of the rocks are calcium carbonate. A lot of carbon is buried. So that changes the carbon-12, carbon-14 ratio and makes things right after the flood look older than they really were. So, but the fact that carbon-14 is still there is amazing because there should be no carbon-14 at all uh, within about 80,000 years. 
So, also, there's human footprints were discovered in Crete in 2002, dating to 6.5 million years ago, which is shocking from an evolutionary perspective because Lucy, who's the transitional species between humans and chimps, her footprints were dated at 3.2 million years ago. And here we have a modern human footprint in Crete dated twice as old. And so, again, that doesn't make sense. Uh, like, the humans evolved m multiple times from apes or, or what? Also, bigger and better in the past. Right after the flood, everything was bigger, a lot bigger. And they lived longer. Uh, and they did a lot better in the past. So the Pleistocene megafauna, right after the flood, during the tertiary period, we have examples of these megafauna. Uh, here's a two-ton armadillo. How would you like that in your garden? Rooting around. Uh, <laughs> one to two-ton armadillos. <laughs> it's like, hello, can you please exit my yacht? Here's an uh, eight-foot uh, beaver, giant beaver, weighed 485 pounds. Swimming around, that would plug up some riverways, right? Giant beavers. Giant sloths. Here, here's me. I'm in the Amazon holding a five-pound sloth. But back uh, right after the flood, there were five tons. Five-ton sloths. They had giant dragonflies. That, uh, the wingspan were 30 inches, so two and a half feet. You could carry, carry away small children. <laughs> right? He had uh, Gigantopithecus, a giant ape, 10 feet tall. Megalodons, giant sharks, 50 feet, uh, some say uh, as much as 30 meters, 90 feet long. Uh, great white sharks in comparison are only 20 feet long. So there's a great white, there's a megalodon, and there's a scuba diver. It would be like a light snack before breakfast. So Neanderthals uh, were also had bigger bodies, bigger brains. They could run farther because they had occipital buns. They lived longer, and uh, they're genetically human. And they're, initially, they were kind of thought to be a transitional species between apes. So they were depicted as kind of ape men. But subsequent, more modern interpretations of Neanderthal are on the right there. And it looks like Jean, Par Jean Picard. <laughs> Jean-Luc Picard, you know, on Star Trek, you know. So it, it seems like right after the flood, the people actually did better right after the flood. We became kind of wimpy after, after that. They did these studies with the occipital bun. It's a, it's a protrusion on the back of the skull that's weighted a little bit. And studies done on this mean that if you put a weight on the back of your head, they should do this for like long distance runners. You can't actually want, run farther because the, your face is heavy. The modern human face is heavy and causes your head to bob up and down as you're jogging. But if you put a weight on the back of your head, it stops the bobbing motion a little bit and makes you able to run farther. <laughs> Bizarre, isn't it? So anyway, that's what I got for today. This is only like, you know, 2% of what's available. I had to pick and choose. So, but this is just a little taste of why I still believe the Bible. I believe what the author said. I believe what they intended to say. And I believe that it actually happened. Because there's really good evidence for it. And it get, for me, it gives me confidence in the rest of the Bible that I can't test and evaluate some of the metaphysical claims, Jesus and the virgin birth, and, you know, that Jesus is coming again, that, you know, there's a new Jerusalem waiting for me someday. All these things take credibility from the reality of Genesis. And so for me, it's like the Genesis actually makes a lot of sense. And it gives me a lot more confidence and hope in the future and the rest of the claims of the Bible. And so that's why I'm here today. So thank you guys. Uh, happy Sabbath and God's blessing. Thank you, Sean. That was a whirlwind tour. <laughs> that was a flood. My goodness.
Our closing hymn is Give Me the Bible, yeah, which is very appropriate. So I encourage you to open the Word of God and to read through it, not only just the New Testament, the Old Testament all the way through, because it's reliable. Please join me in standing. Number 272, Give Me the Bible. Spoken, hold a place left to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for not only sharing with us your word in the Bible and uh, that gives us hope and confidence in the future, but that we can read it in, intelligently and have a, a sincere and honest trust in your word based on empirical evidence that appeals to uh, the rational mind that you, always, that you also created for us. And we thank you for these gifts, uh, for giving us your word, coming to die for us on the cross, and that we can trust that you really do love us and care for us, and there really is a bright future waiting for us. In Jesus' name, amen.